Well, um, I'm going to preach on the theme of to hope is human, to fulfill divine, with a subtitle of banana skins in mulching bins. In many places people are talking about hope. I've already spoken on a couple of occasions in different contexts over the past couple of weeks on the theme of uh, seeking hope in the Anthropocene. I admit that that title sounds like a try-hard theologian wanting to impress his audience. It's fun trying to make up catchy themes that sum up what you're trying to communicate. On one other occasion I came up with a title that came from the author Gabriel Garcia Marquez's famous novel Love in the Time of Cholera. So I called my sermon Hope in the Time of Climate Change. I think that title is okay. It's easily understandable, and if anyone has read the book, well, that's an added bonus. Seeking hope in the Anthropocene, more questionable. It provokes questions, which of course is my intent. That word seeking hints at worry. Why would we have to seek hope is the question it provokes. Are things going so badly wrong that we need to seek hope? But that word Anthropocene really gets people going, or perhaps shuts them down. The other night, I came to my venue where I was to speak quite early to prepare for my address. The first patron to arrive went straight for it. He thought that Anthropocene might mean the study of humans. But that endeavour, of course, is called anthropology. I and my host, on that occasion Associate Professor Clive Pearson, spent a long time over the evenings explaining that geologists have divided the world's history into eons and eras and periods of geological history. Some geologists are now arguing that humans have become the dominant force shaping planet Earth and that we should not say that no longer are we in the Holocene era, we're in the Anthropocene. Rising sea levels over the past century, we've managed to achieve that by, the dint, by dint of burning fossil fuels. <coughs> Dust storms and rivers that resituate the world's soil, sweeping it out to sea in the Bay of Bengal and elsewhere. We clear, we humans clear the land of trees whose roots hold the soil, and that's particularly serious in the Himalayas where gravity takes over quite soon. Increased radiation in layers of soil that will become rock, I presume, in South Africa? Well, that has come surely from the explosion of nuclear devices elsewhere around the world. DDT in the fat layers of Arctic, Antarctic dwelling penguins. Yep, we're responsible for that too, and so on. I could spend my 15 minutes, this will be edited to 15 minutes if, it's, um, if I haven't finished by then. I could spend that time giving us reasons for not having hope. You know how people have taken to using the term on an industrial scale to mean extremely large? Well, I think the word geological might be even better. You know, the president, take the country you pick, the president tells porkies on a geological scale, you might be able to say. This fancy word, Anthropocene, tends to engender hopelessness. But I'm not going to heap up reasons for hopelessness, and that's principally because of my faith in God. That's what Christians principally bring to the ecological table, so to speak. The title I've given this address draws from Alexander Pope's famous aphorism in an essay on criticism. I think some of us probably know it. To err is human, to forgive divine. To err is human, to forgive divine. So I suggest that to hope is human, to fulfill divine. Which is all well and good, but I've been playing around with words for a while now. The other day I was chatting with the person, a person who coordinates my church's community garden. Suddenly that person rounded on me, 
Who has thrown these banana peels in the rubbish bin? They uh, asked rather challengingly, I suppose. Um, I replied, um, that would be me. <laughs> I thought this sounded like I was headed for the confessional. <laughs> well, why didn't you put them in the mulching bin? That's how we make soil. The person replied in tones that hinted strongly that while I might know a thing or two about eco-theology, I quite obviously knew three-fifths of Newly Squat about practical environmental <laughs> <laughs> Someone in my congregation in Normanhurst have started a community garden. It's been a wonderful thing to do for a number of reasons. The, and the best reason is that it exemplifies the name Uniting Earth has given its national e-conference, Hope in Action. This discussion about the relationship between theology and practice is a little like the discussion in the book of James about faith and works. But someone will say, wrote James, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I by my works will show you my faith. My job, my task as an eco-theologian is to explain to us why I have hope at a time when many are hopeless. But there's no use in having hope unless you act it out. Faith without hopes is dead, hope is, or without works is dead, and hope without its expression in works is not only useless, it's hopeless, it's hapless. So I put the banana skins in the mulching bin, <laughs> rather hastily. But I still need to be able to tell people why it's a good thing to bother putting banana skins in mulching bins. There are a lot of people writing about hope at the moment. The great German Jürgen Moltmann wrote Theology of Hope some decades back. It remains as something of a textbook on the subject. Much more recently, Australians Claire Dawson and Mick Pope combined theology, geology and ecological practice in a climate of hope, church and mission in a warming world. And this year, the American Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann published A Gospel of Hope. But I would like to conclude this paper by paying attention to N.T. Wright's argument in one of his most important books, Surprised by Hope. Wright is a particularly prolific author and one of the foremost proponents of the so-called new, new creation theology. In Surprised by Hope, Wright first of all critiqued two currently popular beliefs about the cosmic future, which, although very different from each other, are both sometimes confused with Christian belief itself. The first is the myth of progress, the belief, strengthened by Darwin's theory of evolution, that everything is, in the words of the Beatles song, getting so much better all the time. One particularly destructive aspect of the myth of progress is what the Australian author Clive Hamilton has called the economic growth fetish, and to coin a word, affluenza. That the myth of progress demands a continual economic growth in a world of finite resources is dangerous enough itself but N.T. Wright argued that the myth of progress's fundamental fault is that it cannot cope with evil. Although the past century has seen two <coughs> devastating world wars, the threat of nuclear holocaust, and now the additional threat of ecological cat catastrophe, the myth of progress is still commonly believed. The second option is the belief that the most appropriate human task is to get in touch with true reality, which is beyond space, time and matter. This thinking originated with the Greek philosopher Plato, but most Christians think that Christianity is committed to at least a soft version of Plato's position. The created world is thought to be, by many, at best an irrelevance 
at worst a dark, evil, gloomy place. Many Christians believe that the purpose of being Christian is simply, or at least mainly, to go to heaven when you die. Perhaps not much hope there. N.T. Wright argues over against both of these popular but mistaken views that the central Christian affirmation is that what God has done in Christ and supremely in Christ's resurrection is what he in intends to do for the whole world, for the whole cosmos. Having cleared away these two false options, Wright then named and described what he called the fundamental structures of Christian hope. Three of them. The goodness of creation. The nature of evil. And thirdly, God's plan of redemption. These three structures, as Wright names them, summarise the Christian message. A good, powerful God created a good world which was infected and corrupted by evil. But God has a plan whose decisive phase has already been enacted in, through and by Jesus on the cross and by his resurrection. Then Wright explored six main themes to be discovered in the New Testament. These themes flesh out, if you like, uh, the three structures that he's spoken of. Several of these themes are powerful images taken from the world of creation. Seed time and harvest is one. And then he mentions the victorious battle and citizens of heaven colonizing earth. And God will be all in all is the fourth. The fifth is the theme of new birth. And lastly, and you get this mostly perhaps from the book of Revelation, the marriage, the theme of the marriage of heaven and earth. Now each of these six themes and whatever else I've speak, been speaking of of Tom Wright requires at least another paper to flesh out what they mean. But alas, or perhaps just as well, time does not permit. Rather, I conclude with Wright's hopeful conclusion that only in the Christian story itself, certainly not in the secular stories of modernity, do we find any, that, any hint that the problems of the world are solved, not by a straightforward upward movement into the light, but by the Creator God going down into the dark to rescue humankind and the world from our plight. And that, I suggest, is a good theological basis for expressing our eco-theological hope in ecological action.